Welcome to another episode of Mysteries Unknown. In tonight's podcast, I've got Juan with me, and Juan had a pretty incredible encounter with Bigfoot uh, when he was younger in 77, and then he had another encounter when he was camping with his grandkids, and a lot of strange things happened. This is pretty scary. A lot of a lot of weird things happened in this encounter. I'm going to let him get into that, but before I do, if you have an encounter that you would like to send me, you can send it to me by email at video at jscreativear.com. Let's jump right into the story. Juan, welcome to the show, man. Uh, glad to be here. Man, I'm excited to have you here. I'm excited to hear this story. It's kind of where my dad grew up. So take us back to Ohio in uh, 77 when you had this encounter and kind of walk us through it. Yeah. Um, on my way to w- work uh, one morning, early in the morning, um, daylight was just barely breaking. And uh, I was traveling on, I believe it was Route 235. Um, and I went through the town of Ada. Uh, headed up to the highway, uh, I-75, which uh, that area, too, is near uh, Bluffton, Ohio. But anyway, um, uh, I had a uh, 69 Chrysler Imperial, a low-sitting vehicle, and, I mean, she was a cherry, she was a cream puff. But anyway, uh, there was three objects in the road and they were uh, positioned, they were staggered in such a way that no vehicle could go on either lane without running over them. And so I wasn't going to run over them and I pulled over on the side of the road, um, you know, before them, before them and got my gloves out of the the floor of the car and walked up to them. And I, I'm looking at the scene there. Um, there were two dogs, but there were only three pieces. Um, the Labrador was all there. It was a big black lab, and it was torn in half. There was no blood on the roadway, um, and the other dog was a shepherd. I could. It was a full-grown German shepherd, a uh, big shepherd. Um, I could tell by the tails and the coloring of the body, the rear part of the body. Uh, I didn't see the front end of the body anywhere. And uh, I looked on the side, both sides of the road, and I didn't see it. And that's when I started, you know, looking. And I wish I would have took closer detail because I just noticed that there was no blood on the road. It didn't seem like there was no no innards to them. Um, The lab out of the mouth had some intestine coming out of the mouth uh but i didn't see no intestines on the road or you know coming out of the body or anything like that um and i'm looking i'm thinking you know what the heck and uh it is just you know barely getting light and so i drag them off to the side of the road and uh um you know and i look again to see if i can see the other dog and uh, you know and i'm wondering well it wasn't no the dogs weren't, you know, doing their thing in the middle of the road and the truck came by and ran them over and tore them up. It wasn't that situation at all. Um, but uh, as I pulled the last one off to the side of the road, I had this creepy feeling like I've never had before and I've never had since um, where something was watching me or looking at me or coming coming up on me or something i can't explain it but i got shivers on me and you know the whole time when i you know got out of the truck and looking at i mean the car and looking at the the pieces and that and looking around i didn't get a no sensation um and i couldn't get in the car fast enough i i was like a kid like you know they got spooked i jumped in the car and i went (laughs) you know and took off down the road and there was no cars that came, you know, during that time or nothing. Anyway, went on the way to work and, uh, didn't think much of it after that, you know? Um, and, uh, I was with the work crew, um, afternoon at lunch break and we were on the side of the road and, you know, guys are talking and stuff like that. And I told the one guy, I said, well, I seen something weird coming into work today. And uh, the one guy, I remember his name was Brian. He was uh, the older of the work guy on the work crew. He was like 30 something years old. And he would always talk about how 
you know, it was a young man's job and that he's getting too old for it. But anyway, I told him what I seen and he, he got interest real quick. He goes, where was this? And, uh, and I told him and he goes over to the, he says shots over to the foreman. He goes, you hear that Tom? And, uh, he didn't hear me. And he goes, no, what, you know, Brian says, go ahead and tell him. So I told him and he goes, ah, oh. he goes, that's, uh, yeah, that's not too far from Bluffton where they've been, that area has been having, uh, livestock mutilations and they don't know what it is, but they kind of suspect it's a large cat, maybe a tiger or lion that might escape from somewhere somebody had or something because there was claw marks found on, um, on a barn or barn door or something like that. They told me, and I said, really? And, uh, you know, that kind of interested me. And, uh, uh, you know, when I went back home, I didn't even bother to look to see if them pieces were there or whatever, you know, I just, that stuff kind of just went over me. I did, when I got home, the younger brother, uh, the, the two brothers that were I shared the place with, um, I asked him, I says, uh, do you, do you remember hearing about some kind of mutilations and, you know, over there by Bluffton and that? And uh, he says, yeah, yeah, I think I do remember something like that. And that's about all, he, you know, he told me about that. But that has been with me to this day, wondering what could have done that. Because honestly, the best I can describe it is like if you took a mouse, like if you were a big, strong guy and you took a mouse and clamped him in the middle and popped him right in half. You know, and the 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 ends of the, you know, departure, you know, whatever are kind of tattered and kind of pulled, you know, kind of weird like. And uh, that's the best I can describe it. It wasn't a cut, you know, with a with a saw or something like that. It was like I said, the best I could describe it is just like if you're a big guy and you took a mouse and popped him in two. Um, anyway. Um, fast forward to, uh, um, it was 1996. Um, I used to go out to, um, uh, Burr Oak Primitive Camping out there by, um, um, well, it's the Burr Oaks, by the Burr Oak State Park. They got the state park camping, then they got the primitive area. And it's pretty nice that the, the spots are spread out and it's, it, it's a nice, you know, place if you want, you know, your privacy in that. But, uh, one of the nights it was just me and my wife at the time. Um, the kids were spending a lot of time with their grandmother or something. And it was, uh, uh, after work, um, me and her went down there. And, uh, we grabbed, uh, we were the only, we found out in the morning we we're the only ones there, but it was like one thirty in the morning, something like that when we got there and we set up camp, um, at the first campsite by the entrance because we didn't want to go back too far back in there and dark and all that stuff. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't know. We just felt more comfortable and we got inside the tent and all that. We didn't light a fire or nothing. We were tired and, uh, we heard this bird sound and uh, I've heard this a couple times also. And boy, that really perks up my ears when I hear somebody talk about that. Um, it was the strangest sounding screeching type bird I ever heard. Uh, I've never heard anything like it. And it was loud. And I remember my wife saying, what in the heck is that? And, uh, I, you know, I said, I don't know, you know, maybe it's some kind of, some kind of bird, some kind of owl, maybe, but that wasn't no owl. Um, and it made noise for a while and, you know, we kind of ignored it and we went to sleep and, and in the morning anyway, um, we moved to another camp spot and that's when we seen that we were the only ones there that night. Um, but we didn't, I think we spent one more night and, uh, nothing, nothing occurred. But later on that year, we took the kids and I had a eight year old, a 12 year old and a 14 year old. And uh, we had two tents. I had a uh, uh, one of the nylon two 
two room tents and that's what the kids had here for the boy you know to sleep on the one side and the girls on the other and uh, uh me and the wife had a three-man dome tent we had a little off to the side in in the pines where the pines started and um the next morning oh let me backtrack a little bit um that day when we got there we set up the tents and all that and then we took off to went to go fishing and we went fishing and all that and i think we we kind of went in a little town near there i can't remember it right now um no, it starts with an S, but anyway, uh, so we got back to camp and we were hungry and we had bought a lot of food. Um, you know, we had bought steaks, uh, chicken, hot dogs and hamburgers, and we cooked up a bunch of it. Um, but anyway, as we, when we got there, my son said he was going to change clothes and that's all right. You know, and so the two girls, and uh, my wife and I were by the fire getting ready to get the fire ready. And uh, my son comes out, you know, maybe five minutes later, 10 minutes later, something like that. And he goes, nice try, Dad. And uh, I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, yeah, nice try. You're trying to scare me. I said, I didn't try to scare you. I've been here the whole time. And my girl said, yeah, Dad's been here the whole time. He, he you know. And uh, I said, why? He goes, uh, he goes, you weren't in the back of the tent, hitting the back of the tent with a stick or something, were you? And I said, no, I wasn't doing that. And uh, we kind of blew it off. And uh, anyway, that night is when they seen, we, we built a fire, we ate, and we had a lot of food left. And I was always one to kind of, you know, kind of give the, surrounding animals some food i know a lot of people say oh you don't want to do that and this and that but you know i do what i do <laughs> but uh uh so and i had four plates of uh paper plates of food you know hot dogs and hamburgers and the, the steak was kind of tough i think we we got some kind of uh i don't know flank steak or you know it was a tough steak you know thin steak and so it wasn't really that good anyway and i put four plates on the corners of our campsite and I built up the fire and I went to bed and uh, the next morning we got up and we were going to go we planned on going fishing and uh, so we went fishing but even before you know we we got you know the kids started saying dad there was something out by the fire here last night and uh, it was big and uh, they said at first we thought it was you in Edna, that was her name, my wife at the time, uh, Edna. And uh, we thought that it looked like maybe you were sitting on the stool uh, of the bench and she was sitting on the tabletop, you know, standing up, you know, or sitting up behind you. And uh, I had given my son a little, uh, but I don't think it was a flashlight because it was really weak, one of those little plastic, flashlights that you could put one uh double a battery in i don't know if you remember those i don't think you can even find them anymore but uh i uh i gave him one of those and uh they heard something and they parted the the tent um uh, the the screen was zipped up but the tent part wasn't zipped up and they kind of opened it a little bit to look outside and they told me that the embers were just, you know, just embers at the time. And, you know, they seen what they seen. And my son put the flashlight there to see a little better. And they were all looking out, you know, the 8 and the 12 and the 14-year-old. And they said whatever it was looked up. It wasn't, you know, what they thought. It was kind of like looked up and stood up at the same time. And they seen these red eyes. And they said they freaked out and went to the back room of the tent and stayed real quiet the rest of the night. They said they didn't hear nothing or nothing, you know. And they were trying to tell me this the following day. And I blew it off, you know. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of feel bad, but yet I've heard similar stories where 
you know, kids aren't so much believed. And uh, anyway, um, where we were camping at was at the end campsite, and it was a little turnaround there with uh, uh, like telephone poles, half cut telephone poles, you know, uh, uh, like a barrier. So nobody, you know, goes racing around the circle and goes into the campsite. But anyway, I told him, maybe it was just a raccoon, you know, standing on one of them things or something, you know. I, I, I didn't give it no thought, no thought whatsoever. And uh, so the then the next night, um, and this is weird, and, and I've never heard anything like this, um, that we were sleeping. And like I said, our dome tent was a little bit away from their cabin tent. And we had two coolers, one with the beverages, which I had beer and pop in there and pop bottles. And the other one had the food. Um, and uh, sleeping and I wake up to bottles rattling in the cooler with ice, you know, a distinct sound. And I'm waking up to this noise. And it woke my wife up also because she's the one that first said something. She goes, something's in the cooler. And I says, yeah, I know I hear. And uh, so I get up and, uh, and it, I mean, it was not just a little tingle. It was like, ding, <laughs> like they were making a noise intentionally. Um, so I thought, what the heck? And there's no houses around there. You know, and there was only one other camper at that time there. And uh, anyway, I got up and I'm making noise clearing my voice because I don't know what's out there. I don't know if it's somebody out there or, you know, what. And, you know, anyway, and I took my hatchet and the flashlight and I could get out of the tent and I point the flashlight at me. And I take the hatchet and I'm going up and down, up and down like this. So whoever may see me may think this guy's nuts, you know, um, because it, it was very, very strange. Anyway, um, I go out there and the beverage cooler was underneath the seat of the picnic table. And you couldn't stick a matchstick. I had one of those old. Uh, um, Coleman coolers with the green metal body. It was a, a you know plastic inner, but it had the green metal uh, sleeving around it and a white uh, the white plastic top. And you know I look at it and I flip the top to see if maybe a raccoon or some other animal might have stuck its hand in there and you know swished it around. But you know that would have been very remote to make that kind of noise. But you couldn't, like I said, you couldn't fit a matchstick in there. And I thought, huh? And it baffled me. And I thought, what the heck? And I didn't flat, I didn't point the flashlight around as I was going to the bench. I had it on me. And after that, you know, I looking at the, with the flashlight on the, on the cooler and all that stuff, I looked around a little bit, but I didn't see anything. And so I go back to the tent and my, my wife's up and she goes, what was it? I said, I don't know. You know, this, the cooler's underneath the seat. You know, I, I don't know. And uh, so anyway, I go back to sleep and get up in the morning. And just to, to pause on that part, up to that part of the story, I, I've thought about this over and over and over again. Um, because strange, you know, I'm thinking of the bird sounds, a weird, loud bird sounds. What was, what was it trying to do? You know, if it's something out there, what was it trying to do? It was probably trying to get me to get out of the tent to, to take a look at me or something. Because I thought about the rattling bottles also. I thought, what in the heck would be the purpose of that? And I'm thinking, you know, the hitting of the tent when my son was in the tent was something trying to draw one of the kids out. You know what I mean? Because I've, I've thought about this a lot. Um, anyway, it was the next morning 
we got up and we were making breakfast and we were, we were going to leave that day. Anyway, we had make, made breakfast and we we're sitting at the, uh, the picnic table eating. And the, the other camper, he had a, uh, uh, he had a Cherry 70, I, I believe it was a 73 Chevy Suburban. I mean, it was in mint condition. This was back in 19, I, I'm pretty sure it was 96. Um, and he had an old tent also, one of those uh, old canvas tents with the uh, aluminum framework on the outside. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with one of those old old type tents, but it was in good shape and he had one of those type of tents. But anyway, they come driving around the circle and they're going real slow, man. I mean, real slow, like five miles an hour. They're going slow and they're looking at us. It's the man, his wife and little girl. And the little girl looked like she might have been six or seven or something like that, you know, young. And uh, it's obvious that they're looking, staring at us. He straightens out the vehicle from the circle and he stops and he gets out and he says, uh, excuse me for interrupting your breakfast. He goes, but did you guys see some kind of large animal out here last night? Um, and I said, no, no. And my kids, my kids didn't say nothing yet. Uh, he said, because something, he heard something getting into his cooler. And he opened up the tent flap, pointed the flashlight, and he said this thing had its back to him. He said it looked like it was squatting down. Um, but he said as soon as he put the light on the back of it, it jumped backwards towards the tent. And he said it must have grabbed the uh, one of the aluminum bars of the tent because he said he thought the tent was going down for sure. And uh, And he said all he could think of doing was yelling. And I didn't hear nothing. I didn't hear nothing. Um, and anything, anybody else. And he goes, I don't know what it was, uh, a dog or a bear. Um, and uh, my kids lit up and said, see, Dad, told you. See, see, Dad. And he looked at me and I told him real quick what, you know, the kid, kids said they seen. Um, and Anyway, we went on discussing. He goes, you know, and he said this several times. I don't know if it was a dog or a bear. And I said, well, you know, dogs get pretty big because uh, it wasn't too long before that. I seen some lady had this big old farm dog. I mean, it was huge. And I said, I've seen some pretty big dogs. And he goes, no, dogs don't get that big. And, uh, um, and I said, well, it could be a bear because, you know, I'm sure bears are around here somewhere. He said the same thing. Bears don't get that big. And he, you know, he said it again. I don't know what it was, a dog or a bear. I said, well, how about a wolf? Maybe a wolf or something. He says, I grew up in Oregon. He goes, I've seen plenty of wolves. He goes, wolves don't get that big. And he said, uh, in fact, that's where he was. Go he was going to the ranger station because uh, 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 that primitive campsite was an honor system where you know, you, you put in your campsite and your car license plate number and you put in, it, it was $5 a night there then, um, you know, $5 a night for how many nights you're going to stay. And he said he, he uh, put up, I don't know, I can't remember how many days he, he's paid up for. And he was going to the ranger station and, and to let them know unless they can guarantee his safety that he wanted a refund and they were leaving. Um but we had, I, I didn't see him after that. You know, we had, after we ate, we packed up and we left. That was a long couple of nights. And, and I'm sure looking back now, knowing that that thing was out there, you felt, you know, uh, very fortunate to that nobody got hurt and that your grandkids are okay. And I mean, I can imagine seeing that, what kind of impact that had on them. And generally one of the first things I ask people, and there's a lot of things I want to ask you, but first I want to know, and how did that encounter, knowing what you know now and you putting all this together, the first one in 77 and then that one, how did th those encounters affect your life? Well, the one right off the bat is I haven't been camping since, you know. Um, and uh, uh, I started listening to, uh, well, I started reading books and started listening to people's story. Um, uh, not too long after that, uh, uh, 
and another reason I, I didn't go camping, I, I was a over the road truck driver for about 21 years after that. And, uh, so I, I, you know, what time I had, that might've been part of it, you know, just didn't have the time. And, but as a truck driver, you know, there's a lot of podcasts and stuff like that. And, you know, I would listen to all that stuff after, you know, after those encounters, you know, trying to, and I heard stories similar to, you know, what, uh, uh, certain aspects, uh, like the bird sound, but it sounded like the bird sound, it sounded like something trying to imitate some kind of weird bird. It wasn't a bird. That was not a bird, man. It was like something trying to imitate a bird. Um, some kind of wacky bird. There's a lot of people I talked to. I was talking to one guy and he was on the, the West Coast, I think in Washington State. And tell me about this encounter they had on their property where this they would hear his name uh, in the middle of the woods. Something would be screaming his name or hollering him with his name. And he could tell that it was, wasn't was really a, a normal sounds or language like it, it was trying, trying to mimic something. So I think that's something that they do and pretty common with them. And I guess maybe like you said, trying to figure out what you were, you know, get a good look at you maybe. But I want to go back to the the encounter you had in 77 and, and kind of talk a little bit about that. Um at that point in time, did you had you heard anything? I guess you hadn't heard anything about the the, the animals being mutilated in that area and stuff like that. But when you talk about the 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 feeling that you felt, kind of describe that a little bit more uh, for our audience, if you can. I know a lot of people talk about you know feeling sick to their stomach, uh, just an over overwhelming you know just fear. Was it was it something like that? I guess. Um. It was a more, I got to say, like a uh, creepy uneasiness. I didn't, you know, like some of these, you know, I didn't smell nothing. I didn't hear nothing. And it was quiet because out there, I mean, you know, I might have heard some crickets. might have been some crickets, but, you know, I, I don't know. You know, that's why I said I wish I would have noted more things, you know. I would have, you know, like. Is there any other sounds like crickets or anything like that? Because after that, I learned where, you know, things go silent, you know, um, and uh, and the smell, too. I didn't smell nothing, but I never really, you know, followed up on that stuff where, hey, a lot of people say you, you smell something. So, you know, that wasn't even on, you know, on my radar uh, to see that. Uh, but uh, I would have. I think knowing now, I probably would have picked up a stick or something, you know, before I got the creepy feeling, you know, see if they actually, you know, all their innards were gone. And I don't think there was any blood in the animals, to tell you the truth, you know, because there was just no blood, on, no blood on the road. I don't know of any other animal or creature that could could do something like that you know bears not going to do that they're going to drag it off they're going to eat it you know there's no you know in ohio there's not a whole lot of predators out there there's not a whole lot of big game and things that are going to do something like that so you know and i guarantee you that feeling that you felt is because this thing was watching you and probably approaching you so it's a good thing you got out of there and um before we were talking uh earlier off the, off the podcast you were telling me about a story that happened in that area and kind of what got you interested uh, in Bigfoot. Oh, you're talking about the Brexville? Um, yeah, no, in, in 1966. No, I was uh, I was 10 years old. It was in the paper. There was a sketch of a uh, Bigfoot type looking creature that had uh, stepped out in front of a vehicle and uh, two ladies were on their way home from work and they were traveling through the Brexville park system, uh, Brexville, Ohio. And they, she made the mistake of stopping. And I don't remember if it broke the window or the lady had the window open already, but it grabbed her by the hair. And the other lady tried to save her from being pulled out. And this thing reached in and hit her in the face. And she had a black guy and bruised face. And it ended up taking her. And the other woman took off and got help. And uh, I remember they said they had about 100 volunteers looking for her. And they did find her uh, at some cross sections of some some trails. And uh, but they never seen the creature. But 
that was the story. Oh, and uh, it was a day later. I remember in the Cleveland Press also. It was around right around the Flats area that a guy had taken a shot at. He said it was large and hairy, and it went over his fence. And I don't know how high the fence was, but they did have a picture of it. The guy standing there and kind of, you know, pointing his hand at the fence where he said this thing put its hand on it and bent the top uh, railing post or line, you know, downward where, you know, something pretty heavy, you know, bent it down. And the Cuyahoga River was right behind there, right behind him. But that made the, the news also. But after that, I don't remember anything about that. That was in 66, and that was the first time I heard anything about a, a – I didn't even know it was called a Bigfoot, you know. some Wow, some hairy monster, you know. How far was that uh, from where you first had your encounter with those – you know, with the animals on the roads? How far away was that, do you know? Oh, that, that's uh, – yeah, that's quite a ways. That's probably – Shoot, who knows, 150 miles, 200 miles, something like that. I know a lot of times people, uh, you know, when they think Bigfoot, they think West Coast. And I know here in Arkansas, in the area I'm at, there's all kinds of sightings. But I got a lot of people that, you know, uh, send me stuff from Ohio all the time. And they're definitely all in that area. And, you know, knowing their nature, and I, I think they're evil. I don't think they're good. I don't think they're your friend. And, I I mean, they, they're like people, I'm sure, sometimes where you run into the wrong one. You know, you're going to have a bad day and you run into the right one. It's good. You'll be all right. But knowing all that, I'm sure that you have thought a lot about that, you know, night when you guys were camping and, you know, and how lucky you were to, to be here to share that story. Because that could have went all kinds of sideways, especially if that creature was trying to call you out you know, or, or the kids out or who knows, man. I, I, I know a lot of, I talked to a lot of native Americans and they talk about in their culture where they'll, they'll come and, and take the kids and, and things like that. So makes you wonder, man, it really does. Yeah, it, it really, really does. Cause I, I've thought about that quite a bit and, uh, you know, that's the only thing I can come up with. Um, you know, so that's the only thing, you know, in my mind, just hearing that and thinking about that, that's what makes sense to me. Cause why would it do all that if it wasn't trying to, to draw you out? So you guys are pretty fortunate to, to, to be here to share that story. But you know, I really want to know, man, after all that and the research that you've done, um, what do you think Bigfoot is Juan? I think it's demonic. I really do. You know, the Bible talks about how in the end, you know, that, uh, pestilence, war, and wild beasts are going to kill, I think, a third of the population of the world, something like that, you know, all three of them. And I've heard different preachers, you know, speculate on what the wild beasts are. And uh, I know uh, John MacArthur, uh, he kind of thinks it's rats because, you know, but I don't think I don't think God minces words like that, you know, calling a rat a beast. You know, are they to be called upon just like, uh, you know, certain other demons and, you know, uh, fallen angels are going to be called called up in the last day to inflict things on mankind, you know. So, uh, you know, it might be. It might be. I tend to agree with you. I, I definitely think that they fall in something in that realm. You know, I definitely think they're they're demonic. They're not good. And uh, I talked to a lot of people, man, that have these encounters and, you know, they talk about the fear and and all these different things that just that don't make sense. And, and I, I tend to, to believe like that, you know, faith is super important to me and I don't, I don't hide it on this channel and I look at everything through a biblical lens, you know, and, and that's what makes sense to me. And so it's an interesting topic and I like to hear people's opinions. And uh, I also would like to know, and if you had the opportunity to see one again, would you, would you want to? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so because I know there's, there's something out there. I don't know what it is, but I don't think I want to see it. Um, you know, another time, I, I know you said you, you're familiar with uh, Ohio somewhat, but and I'm sure you've heard of Salt Fork, you know, in Ohio. Um, but I remember it was back in the early 80s. Um, me and a, a girlfriend of mine, we were camping, and uh, those were back in my, um, kind of wild days. But uh, I remember we uh, – it might have been late 70s, too. But we were camping and, uh, you know, we were cruising around, drinking some beers in the park. And just, you know, then it, the, the the park wasn't crowded and um, came across this back road, you know, going on this back road. 
and we smelt something dead, you know, and it really stunk. I mean, really stunk really bad. And it was the summertime, and I had this little green uh, Toyota Corolla and had the windows up, and we're just putting down this back gravel road and, you know, smell this smell and, wow, man, something's dead or something. And it, but it seemed like it carried for a while, you know, maybe, a, I don't know, maybe a hundred feet, I guess. I don't know. It was, it was you know, for a while, I said, wow, that, that's something else. And, uh, there's, you know, and I started looking, I didn't see nothing. And, but on one side, it was kind of like a drop. I don't know if you call it a, a little bit of a gorge or cliff or whatever. But anyway, so, you know, something could have been down there, but, so we went on, didn't think about it. Well, the next day we were still there and we kind of did the same thing again, you know, driving around. But when we drove down that gravel road, guess what? We didn't smell nothing. So if there was a dead animal there, where'd it go? That makes you scratch your head, man. There's a lot of unknown mysteries when it comes to this stuff. And I, I think that's what intrigues me so much about it. But well, man, I appreciate you sharing that with my audience, man. Thanks for being here. If you if you see or hear anything else in the future, man, make sure to let me know. All right. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for having me. Well, again, man, thanks for being here. I really enjoyed that. And guys, thank you for being here. I appreciate you being part of this podcast because without you, it would not be possible. I'm so grateful that I get to do this and I appreciate you guys being here along for the journey. And like always, if you've got a mystery or a Bigfoot encounter you would like to talk to me about, you can send it to me by email at video at jscreativear.com. And like I always say, stay prayed up. We'll talk to you in the next episode.